outcomes. So right now, let's go back into what the Templars were attempting to do. Now you make an intriguing observation in the Thrice Great Hermetica book that around the Templar era, there were actually some attempts to create a Hermetic state or a Templar state. Mm -hmm. And that received a major pushback at the time. And I find this so interesting. And it makes sense to me because there's this amazing release of this ancient wisdom mm -hmm. seemingly out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that later, uh, the Rosetta Stone is part of that knowledge spree also. It's almost as if these esoteric teachings are being poured into society to break up these power circles that have become archaic. Right, exactly. Well, you know, the idea of a Templar state, this is, this is the other thing that makes the Albigensian Crusade so extremely suspicious because uh, I think it was um, King Juan II of, of Aragon that on his death willed his entire kingdom, you know, the area around Barcelona in modern-day Spain, willed that whole kingdom to the Templars, huh. you know, which would have set up their state. And then you have the fact that just across the Pyrenees Mountains, you've got this heavy Templar presence in the Cathar region of the Languedoc, all right? So in other words, it looks to me like, yes, the Templars were trying to do something using all that power and all their wealth to literally, you know, thumb the nose at the very institution that had given them that power. And the papacy turns right around and, you know, smashes it. Um, but had they been successful in doing that, had they been successful in creating their own kingdom and then coupling it somehow with the Cathar region, this would have been, you know, the, 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 right in the middle of the papacy's backyard in the most prosperous region of Europe to boot at the time. Right. Uh, this would have unhinged the power structure of the day. Talk about revolutionary. You know, there would not have been anything even remotely like it. Even the Renaissance with the huge change in, in cosmological outlook that it brought about, even that didn't do anything so much revolutionary politically. That took some time for that to work out in, in European history. This would have been huge. This would have been epical. Yeah, just amazing. Well, it would have been this Templar super state, yes. and it would have incorporated all of these fantastic teachings and findings that they had discovered. Right. And then after that, they're suppressed, and years later, there are little fragments circulating around, and you can almost get the impression out there from these incomplete parts, right. you know, Rosicrucian teachings, esoterica, these mystical right. influences of something left over and trying to carry on, trying to reconstitute once again. Right. Well, the Rosicrucians are very interesting, I think, uh, <laughs> because if you read the, the manifestos, one of the most interesting things that they state is that the symbol of this secret college is what? It's a red cross on a white background. Yeah. You know, this is the corporate logo oh, yeah, <laughs> of, right. the of the Templars. You know, the other one the other one being a red rose on a white background, you know. And that's very symbolic because, you know, the whole expression sub rosa, under the rose, meant back at that time that these were matters that were to be kept secret and confidential. It was it was uh the, it was the jargon of espionage of the day, okay? Interesting. So, you know, even that symbolism is an indicator that, that these manifestos are talking about not just a secret college, but they're talking about a secret intelligence agency, you know? Right, yeah. So um, the very fact that you're, you're talking in, in those manifestos and using those types of symbols, we have to under remember that when the Templars were suppressed, the decree of the Council of Vienne in France stated that any display of Templar symbols or insignia was an excommunicable offense, and it was a reserved excommunication. In other words, in, in the parlance of canon law, what that meant was it, it, you didn't have to 
go through the process of an ecclesiastical court and have the local bishop excommunicate you, just doing it did it. I see, yeah. You see? So this becomes hugely significant if you have these manifestos now using the symbolism. And let's not forget who else uses this symbolism proudly and openly displayed on the sails of the three ships that he sails to America to, quote, discover the, the place. He's, you know, Christopher Columbus, Columbus yeah. boldly displaying these Templar insignia, you know, with the collusion of Ferdinand and Isabella. <laughs> right, so, right. Well, you know, let's talk about Columbus here. Sure. Uh, you do a lot of very interesting analysis about Columbus, and one of the things you do is tie the Templar's search to these cartographic traditions of ancient maps, and you have some very interesting references in there right. to Admiral Pirarese and his book on sea lore. Oh, yeah. And he says some very interesting things that relate to Columbus. Oh, yeah. Who he calls Columbo. Columbo, yeah. A Genoese. A Genoese. Yes. That, that, that went to the Bay of Spain, you know, the King of Spain, and uh, had these maps and had this book. You know, Piri Reis is very explicit. He said Columbus had a map and he had a book that he's showing Ferdinand and Isabella and so let's let's back up now and find out exactly what may be going on. Yeah. If you look at the Piri race map, which was composed by this Turkish admiral around circa 1530, it's uncanny in that it displays the coast of South America and then Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, wow. Accurately. You know, and Antarctica hasn't even been discovered yet. <laughs> So, it's completely unexplained. It's completely unexplained. And Piri Reese goes on to explain, well, I, I made this map by comparing it to other old sources. So in other words, you know, here's this Turkish admiral sitting there in Constantinople ransacking the Byzantine Empire's imperial archives, and he's coming up with all these old maps, and he's making this map that shows Antarctica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... There is, in other words, evidence that there was a secret cartographic tradition, okay? Now, somewhere along the line, Columbus gets a hold of it. Right. So, we have to figure out how, <laughs> okay? So, this is where it gets interesting. Columbus is from Genoa. Genoa was the great banking maritime rival of Venice, mm -hmm. okay? So, you have both... Venice and Genoa at a certain point in their history had these quarters in Constantinople, ghettos we'd call them now, where the Eastern Roman emperors had granted them wharves and, and docking facilities in Constantinople and taxation immunities to conduct their trade. Okay. Now, this means, in my opinion, that especially after uh, the Fourth Crusade, the influence of these Italian city-states over Byzantium is going to be enormous, and therefore they're probably going to have access at some point to what's in the imperial archives. So why is this important? Because at one time, if you go back in history, the Byzantine Empire stretched all over uh, Mesopotamia, Asia Minor, and then down into Egypt, Right, <laughs> which means they probably had access to whatever was left of, of the Library of Alexandria. Yes. So you've got a, a cartographic tradition that's probably secret in Byzantium for a very good reason. Byzantium sits astride the trading routes of the world, and even though the emperors of, of the Roman Empire may have known, well, there's this whole world over there across the Great Sea but we don't want anybody to know about it because if anybody knows about it, our power, it's gone. You know Exactly. So what happens is this cartographic tradition gets transmitted, I think, by the Knights Hospitallers, by the Knights Templars, to Genoa and Venice. And this is how Columbus gets a hold of it. And it's even more murky because when you look at Columbus and his dealings with Ferdinand and Isabella, I mean, you know, this guy's a piece of work. Because there's a, a, there's a certain point in the capitulations, the, the documents, the contracts that are signed between Ferdinand and Isabella on the one hand and Columbus on the other, that indicates that 
Columbus had some prior knowledge of the New World, and at one point in the convocation between Columbus and Ferdinand and Isabella, she points out to him, sir, it's almost as if you have been there before. <laughs> That's great. I love that. <laughs> you know, in other words, he's not putting anything over on Queen Isabella. <laughs> but, you know, she knows what's going on. Yeah. So, in other words, what we have is, is a very uh, – plausible case that Columbus undertook secret voyages to the new world before his voyage of discovery. Yeah. Okay. So, and again, Piri Reese indicates that this is the case. Yeah. Okay. So that he it happened he, in 1485. In 1485, not 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> so, so what we, what we really have with Columbus's 1492 voyage is mm -hmm. the agreement between Ferdinand and Isabella, Christopher Columbus representing what? Representing that Genoese banking uh, Knights Hospitaller interest and the papacy, that it's time to let all of this out. Okay? And we have to put ourselves in the mentality now of the Italian city states in northern Italy, Genoa and Venice in particular, because what this secret cartographic tradition would have represented to them was the end of their trading empire and the end therefore of their financial power and if they're going to survive if they're going to preserve that power they now have to do so number one by so to speak moving shop and acquiring ports facilities or proxy actors able to do this. So what do you see Genoa doing? Genoa is backing Columbus. Genoa is backing Ferdinand and Isabella along with, guess who else? Florence, the, Demi, uh, the De Medici's. Mm -hmm. And then what does Venice do? Well, they've been kind of cut out of the game. Right. So they're very clever, you know, being Venetians. They move their operation gradually northward through Germany into another city in a swamp called Amsterdam, right. and then from Amsterdam across the channel to England. So in other words, these, these Italian oligarchs <laughs> are, are also behind this in a major way. Right, right. You know, uh, you, 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 Venice, Venice in particular just fascinates the daylights out of me because they are, um, you know, they're the perfide albion of, <laughs> of the day. Uh, and, it, you know, the other thing I point out in, in Thrice Great Hermetica is there is a bit of evidence that Venice actually undertook a voyage to the New World. And let's be frank here. Let's, let's go back to the Templars. Everybody wants to know, the Templars had this immense treasure, supposedly, mm -hmm. that disappeared, apparently, just in time, <laughs> conveniently enough. <laughs> when Philip Lebel decides to shut down the order in France. <clears throat> so where did it go? Where's this big, huge Templar fleet that used to be in La Rochelle, you know? Yeah. So this all, all goes missing, and he shows up, you know, and the preceptory is in Paris, and they're empty, okay? So what happens here? Where are the Templar records? You know, where's the account books? You can't run an international banking concern like the Templar order without keeping account books. Hmm. Okay. And this, again, this is something you don't find academics asking, well, the Templar archives were all over in Rhodes or they were all over in Cyprus and, you know, uh, nonsense like this. Right. <laughs> they just don't think. So Venice, back to the Templars, Venice is allied with the Templars. Let's assume for a moment, Daniel, that the Templars were making voyages to the New World. Okay? Yeah. Let's assume in doing so that they run across a bunch of North American Indians who are mining and producing gold and silver. They bring it back to Europe. This, to me, may be the key to why Venice becomes the bullion capital of Europe. 
Interesting. Because Venice, if you look at Venice's financial activity, I mean, they're ruthless. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at their financial activity, the way that they were able to maintain their power and literally uh, take down their competitors was through some pretty uh, filthy manipulation of the European bullion markets. Mm hmm. Now, if you've got a secret supply of gold and silver bullion coming in, courtesy of your allies, the Templars, that's a very convenient thing by which to be able to do that. And incidentally, for all the academics out there, let's remember what I said earlier. The Council of Ten was founded by Venice three years after the suppression of the Templars. So I think, I suspect, that if you dig long and hard enough in the Venetian state archives, you're going to find some old Templar account books. But nobody has thought to look for them there. Huh. You see, I'm guessing here. I mean, that's just a speculation. But. Okay. Well, we can see the story here is taking a major turn because this idea of the Templars in America is just fascinating. Oh, yeah. And what were they doing there? Yeah, a lot. Um, I mentioned the, the, the Kensington Knight. You know, there's this knight carved on a rock in Massachusetts that, that's, you know, it's real, it's legit, it's there. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this guy, he's dressed out in full armor. He's got this big, huge broadsword that he's holding with a great big cross on it. You know, in other words, it looks Templar. Mm -hmm. And in addition to this, you've got that very bizarre uh, report of modern Zeno uh, in, the, in the 16th century that maintains that a couple of his relatives two centuries before had, had gone up to Scotland and then journeyed over to the New World uh, with, with Prince Henry Sinclair. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, uh, I think that's legitimate. A lot of academics don't, but I think it's legitimate for one very important reason, because first of all, there is a hidden cartographic tradition. And the Zeno family, interestingly enough, was... When when the Fourth Crusade occurred and Constantinople was sacked by the Venetians, interestingly enough, in 1204, the Venetian governor that's put in charge over in Constantinople is a member of, guess what, family, the Zeno family. Okay, he becomes, he becomes the Venetian Podesta over in Constantinople. So in other words, you've got a connection between the Zeno family in Constantinople. You've got the Zenos allegedly making this voyage to the New World a century before Columbus yeah. and reporting on all this gold and stuff over there. Would that be something that Venice would do? Well, absolutely, because Venice is constantly testing, constantly testing these indicators of secrets in or secret traditions to find out if, in fact, they're true. Think of Marco Polo, mm -hmm. you know, another Venetian mm -hmm. who, guess what, gets captured by the Genoese. <laughs> right, right. You know, so. Well, you make interesting references to him uh, in that it's well known, his voyages to the Orient and how he mm -hmm. got over there and explored. But you think that he actually made it to the New World and that they basically yes. said, don't talk about that part. <laughs> right. We're going to make it Japan. Yeah, we're going to make it Japan. Um, yeah, when you when you read Polo, uh, he talks about having to journey from he you know he's journeying with the Chinese. That's in his book, but he talks about this being a journey that took him a year. Well, it does. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't take a whole year in a Chinese junk to travel across the Sea of Japan. You know? <laughs> but Joseph, you realize you have two fundamental tenets of history that gets taught in school. Christopher Columbus in America, 1492. This is real doctrine. And Marco right. Polo discovering... Japan. Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. uh, and like your Chinese didn't know about it already. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, you uh, you come in on both of those and blow them away. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the real key here is is to understand that it's being blown away by looking at the indicators that there is a hidden history that's taking place behind the public narrative that we've been taught yeah and that hidden history the reason it's being obscured in my opinion is that first of all you do have 
um, the presence of intelligence operations. Let, let's just be honest. This is what they are. This is what Venice is doing. This is what the Council of Ten is for. This is what the Templars are doing. And on top of this, you also have something else very interesting. You have, as I said, you have created the mechanism in these crusading orders for the intergenerational accumulation of capital. But this is a very peculiar type of accumulation in that it is not the private property of an individual Templar Knight. It is the property of the order. So in a certain sense, you can look ahead centuries to 19th and 20th century Europe and kind of see in the Templars the beginnings of what we would now call a trust and a cartel. Right. You see, because this is, this is very much similar type of thinking. So in other words, this is also what's going on. And then finally, when you, when you, when you look at the, the geopolitics and financial politics of that age, what you see happening is behind Spain, behind Portugal, you've got remnants of the Templars, you've got Genoese bankers, you've got Florentine bankers that are moving their base of operations. And by the same token, you've got Venetians that are also doing all of this, and they're moving their base of operations. So you're setting up the next big uh, centuries-long conflicts now between the European Atlantic powers and ultimately Great Britain. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, the Venetian connection in Great Britain is particularly strong. I mean, you know, you have Giordano Bruno going up there. You have... Henry VIII with his divorce. Well, who's the lawyer that he consults? He's a Venetian. Yeah. You know, the power politics here is, is, is very real. And, and we have to start looking at European history, particularly during this age, with those kinds of spectacles. Otherwise, it makes no sense. It's just one big, huge collection of names and dates, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. Well, there are huge geopolitical contexts going on that have affected the world we live in now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, the setup is back there, and it's pretty oh, well. Yeah. It's it's pretty well obscured too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When when you start thinking obscurity, why would anyone want to obscure all this? Right. right. You know. Well, I'll tell you why. Uh, let me give you. Let me give you just a little detail here. <laughs> okay. Um, if you study medieval history, you study, you know, the conflict in, in northern Italy between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, all right? The pro-imperial versus the pro-papal people, all right? Well, the Guelphs are the Italian name for a family, for a clan, that across the Alps, there's a German branch of the family. They're called Velf, Velf Eibling, all right? Now, if you look at the family of Velf, they're also tied into, in these very <laughs> complex ways, into, guess what, the House of Orange mm. in the Netherlands. So in other words, you've got this Italian, German, Dutch connection, okay? The House of Orange, of course, is brought over during the British Glorious Revolution. William Stotholder is brought over from the Netherlands to be crowned King of England, William III. You know, War of Spanish Succession and all this stuff. And William, once he gets to England, what does he do? Very significant. What does he do? Okay. 1694, he founds the Bank of England. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is William. This is William Stotholder. All right. That's one little detail. Well, it's so interesting because you link back the powerful interests of our world today with this period and you outline how what we refer to today as the world's most powerful wealthy families who for the most part are having a terrible impact on the world uh, these families go right back to what we're discussing here so yeah this is all part of this history if we don't understand the middle ages and all these complicated marriage alliances going on we're not going to make very much sense out of modern history either yeah, absolutely. And understand how that ruling structure comes into being yes, over many centuries. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we leave Columbus, though, there's one very fascinating detail that you track down about a statement by his son <laughs> about him. 
Well, I didn't track it down. It was, it, it was, it was <laughs> okay. I'm just I'm just reporting on this other guy's research. <laughs> You're I'm just the messenger. Put, I'm trying to put all this together. Um, the the guy's name was um, Ruggiero Marino, an Italian researcher. Wonderful, wonderful research. And what he uncovered was Christopher Columbus's son. I forget what his first name was. Stated that his father was of the of the tribe of David, something to this effect. So, in other words, what he's saying there is that Christopher Columbus was part Jewish. Well, where's this coming from? You know, why why would Ferdinand and Isabella? in the process of setting up the, you know, the notorious Spanish Inquisition, be turning to a Genoese Jew mm -hmm. to back their expedition to reveal the new world and stake out Spanish claims. Well, interestingly enough, Ruggiero also uncovers the fact that on Pope Innocent, the, Innocent VIII's tomb in Rome, engraved on his sarcophagus, is the esoteric signature of Christopher Columbus. Ah. Now, what's Columbus's signature doing on Innocent VIII's tomb? Now, Innocent VIII was... <laughs> I love this. Innocent VIII was a fellow by the name of Giovanni Chibo. And Chibo, Cardinal Chibo, was this fellow who had both Muslim and Jewish relatives. Uh -huh. And he's elected Pope in a conclave where the other candidate is, and here comes a key uh, phrase, is also referred to as a knight. Wow. Wow. So in other words, Chibo himself, being referred to as Cavalieri, as a knight, is probably a member of either the Knights Hospitaller or may have some secret Templar connection. Yeah. And he's elected Pope over the other knight. And so what does Chibo do? Well, Chibo also has, shall we say, as many of the popes <laughs> of the time seem to have had, a libido. <laughs> and... and Chibo, <laughs> Chibo oh boy. prior to being elected Pope, <coughs> as a cardinal, apparently played around a bit <laughs> and, <laughs> and sired all of these children <laughs> all, all over Europe. And it, in Ruggiero's estimation, and I think he's right, Columbus may have been one of, one of his sons. Oh. And this would be where Columbus gets his yeah. Jewishness. Yeah. You know? So on and on we go. You know, there's all these family connections lurking in the background of all of this. That lines up pretty well. Very. Oh very yeah, fascinating. it does. Um, yeah. The uh, well, the big cover story about Columbus's voyage was that it was to find a shorter route to the Spice Islands. <laughs> 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 Why is that so ridiculous? Well, it's ridiculous because, first of all, there's evidence that he did take a secret voyage in 1485. Perry Reese is talking about this. Mm -hmm. And Perry Reese makes it very clear that Columbus had a secret map and a secret book, and he's showing all of this to, to Ferdinand and Isabella. And Ferdinand and Isabella, put yourself in their shoes. Okay, there's something over there. They might have a lot of gold. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore we want it, but we don't want anybody else to, to get there. So we're going to keep all this a secret. Uh, yeah, we'll fund you. And if anybody asks, we'll tell you, tell them, well, you're looking for another route to the spice islands because you think the world is round and you can get to China that way. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, you know, so yeah, you know, <laughs> nothing has changed people. They're, they're putting out spin here. Because remember, Columbus comes back. He says, oh, yeah, I found, you know, this new world over there. And it appears they've got some gold. And, yeah, I planted your flag. Um, and Isabella's comment, sir, it's almost as if you've been there before, you know. <laughs> that is so great. I'm glad yeah, you it. Yeah, it really is. It. 
really is. <laughs> she she lays it right out there. She lays it right out there. <laughs> <laughs> but here's an interesting, fascinating thing: this secret, these secret maps, that whole tradition. Mm -hmm. Those maps are very sophisticated. Yes. And you'd need a pretty high technology to be able to scout out the world that way. Right. Far beyond the kind of ships that a guy like Columbus was using. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. where did those maps come from? <laughs> <laughs> Who was behind them and where Who's did they get the technology? Who's behind those maps? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. Um yeah, you look you look at the medieval portal lines, the uh, dulcim the dulce I forget what the name it begins with a D. Uh, there's this medieval map of Europe mm -hmm. that when you compare it to Ptolemy's map, this medieval map is astonishingly accurate. Oh. It it you know I put it in uh, Financial Vipers of Venice this this portal line. You know, this is a, by the way, a 13th century map that looks like a modern map of Europe. Amazing. I mean, it's, it's that accurate, all right? Where is this coming from? Well, again, my guess is it's coming from the Imperial Archives in Constantinople, which in turn are coming, in my opinion, most likely, from whatever remained of the Library of Alexandria after the burning there. Okay. But that still doesn't answer the question. How are you getting something so accurate out of that library when Ptolemy is producing this <laughs> map of Europe that, you know, perish the thought you'd ever use it to sail a ship or fly on an airplane, you know, because right. <laughs> you're going to crash into some things here, folks. All right. But, All right. <laughs> but I think what this really indicates is that this cartographic tradition ultimately is coming from high antiquity and it's coming from high antiquity because of its extreme accuracy which we have only been able to reduplicate in modern times by very accurate measurement and here comes the curveball by satellites yeah in other words, it's coming from such extreme antiquity that this is a piece of that information that whatever civilization existed back then, it was at least at a similar pitch of scientific and technical development as we are now. Absolutely. And that, you know, uh, that when you when you look at these maps, that's in my opinion, these are some of the strongest evidence that we have that this ancient high civilization really existed. People say, well, you know, where's the evidence of this ancient high civilization? Well, look at some of these maps sometime. Yeah. So one of those maps, the Piri Reis map, depicts Antarctica without any ice. Yes, that's the other problem. <laughs> so how far back do you have to go for that? Well, that's the other problem. You know, it, it, it's showing Antarctica in the right position, and it's showing the coastline of Antarctica more or less. Ac and, you know, you can go online and read these skeptical sites, you know, where they're coming up with the most outlandish things to try and hold on, you know, desperately <laughs> exactly. to, to the conventional narrative. But the bottom line is they can't explain it, you know. The only hypothesis that can explain it is the one they don't want to deal with, and that's a high civilization in high antiquity, or to give it the the dreaded A word, Atlantis. Right? Yes, so, yes. To me, the maps are the clearest indicator that we have, not to mention all these weird structures all over the world that no one can explain how they built these things. Well, in South America in particular. Right? Oh, yeah. Pumu Punku, you know. Uh, <laughs> That's a very advanced civilization. So. It had to have been. Yeah. You know, you, you, you can't produce these things <laughs> without some sort of modern technology. And I, uh, yeah, and I'm sorry, you know, the Incas didn't build them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They'll tell you they didn't build them. You know, um, no, if, if to me, this, this whole thing indicates that, that there's something. And... Since we're talking about this, Daniel, the implication here is is that the possibility arises 
that when you're dealing with people like the Templars or the Hospitallers mm -hmm. or their Genoese and Venetian allies, that they were aware that this was a tradition that came from high antiquity. Yeah. And by the time that the Renaissance breaks out and you have the translation of the Hermetic text, this is when this goes public because we've got to remember at that time the Hermetica was considered to be dated to a, an Egyptian period predating the Old Testament. So in other words, to them, this represented primordial knowledge from that high civilization. So the idea goes public. So in other words, I think it's very possible that the maps in particular may have been viewed by these people as evidences and parts of this lost tradition. Absolutely. And do you think that the maps represent uh, – well, I want to actually go a little deeper on the mystery school's role because somebody had to preserve these ancient maps and pass them down through secret tradition and keep them hidden and just let certain select groups be aware and be in the loop on these things. So the idea of these mystery schools going back to Egypt – and they would understand all kinds of esoteric knowledge, uh, including special kinds right. of physics. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you've written about that. So yeah. these mystery schools survived underground somehow. But was there a point where they died out? Or do you think they've survived right up to our modern era? And were they behind this major influx of occult and esoteric knowledge that showed up you know, on the scene, out of the blue, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Is that the mystery schools at work once again? Ah, uh, that's, that's the, the $64 trillion question accounting for inflation. Um, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, that's, I'll tell you what my intuition is, and then I'll tell you, give you some, um, details that tend to corroborate it. My intuition is, is that yes, we're looking at continuity. Now, the real question is, what kind of continuity are we looking at? Are we looking at continuity merely of ideas? Or are we also looking at continuity of, of organizations, institutions, and personnel? The latter is much more difficult to prove, obviously, and no one really could prove it, but that is exactly what my intuition is, is that we're not simply looking at continuity of idea, but we are looking at groups of people who made it their conscious and deliberate covert purpose to preserve this stuff and hand it down. Now, the reason I think that this is a possibility is that you do have, of course, the appearance of the Rosicrucian manifestos in the early 17th century, but you also have a fellow over in England writing a very peculiar treatise. Yeah. <laughs> but this particular fellow, I, I'm, re I'm referring to Lord Verulam, Francis Bacon. Right. And what does he write? He writes this very weird <laughs> little work. I have a copy of it called called The Advancement of Learning and the New Atlantis. Nice. And when you read The New Atlantis, it's a short little treatise. It's an allegory about a secret society that he calls the Temple of Solomon. And the Temple of Solomon is all about this college of very learned men who sit around dreaming up all sorts of scientific projects for the betterment of mankind. You know, here, here's Francis Bacon. And, you know, he's the Lord High Chancellor, senior advisor to King James and so on and so forth. And he's coming up with all of this. And then, of course, you have the creation of the Royal Society under King Charles II, which, again, is this very weird occasion because what's he creating it for and out of? Well, he's creating it out of the roundheads and the royalists to kind of unite the parties, you know. Let's not have a replay of chopping off my dad's head here. And he is chartering this to do advanced scientific work. And, oh, by the way, it just turns out that both sides of the Royal Society are full of masons. Ah. Okay? So, in other words, 
when you look at these types of organizations, you look at these events, you see very clearly that something is going on behind the scenes. There is an effort to recreate at least or to update the mystery schools. Mm-hmm. Now let me throw a curveball in here. Okay, this is a this is a whopper. I have a little book back here on my shelf that uh, my co-author Scott DeHart and I did in response to our book Transhumanism because we got we got lots of, you wouldn't have believed the amounts of emails we got after that book came out. Well, what does this mean? What does that mean? So we decided to do this little book and answer some of these emails. Okay. And it's called Transhumanism, Transhumanism in Dialogue. It's a little Lulu book that we did. And in it, we point out three gentlemen who made an interesting observation. Yeah. <laughs> the first gentleman is a well-known fellow by the name of Rene Descartes. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, Rene Descartes, wrote a very interesting little thing that in his reading of ancient mathematicians he thought that he had encountered a form of mathematical analysis that the ancients knew that we don't know and that he thinks they suppressed okay and so you know Scott and I are reading this and we think gee that's kind of interesting sure <laughs> because because, you know, among many other activities that, that the good mathematician did, he went off to join the Catholic armies of the Habsburgs at the Battle of White Mountain to defeat the hermetically inspired prince of, of the Rhineland Palatinate, who was going to bring in the New Age. That's so <laughs> odd. Yeah, that's so odd. You know, why, why, why Rene Descartes, of all people? He's a mathematician. And he's a mathematician. You know? <laughs> Strange. You know? <laughs> You don't think of this guy as a soldier going off no, for definitely you know, not. a Catholic crusade. You know, so in other words, there's there's another agenda here. And then there's another gentleman also writing and reading mathematics. And he says, Well, you know, Descartes' right. There's something in these ancient mathematicians. It's a hidden form of analysis. We don't know what it is. It's either been lost to history or these guys way back when suppressed it. And um, we better find out what it is. And his name is Isaac Newton. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so he knows. So he knows something's up. Oh, yeah. And then there's a third, <laughs> there's a third gentleman. And he says, you know what? Um, in reading these guys, I think that they had a form of analysis, and this is the real big one here, this particular guy. Okay. I think they had a form of analysis by which they solved all their problems. It was formally explicit. They had a, an algebraical way of doing this, and it had nothing to do with numbers. And I think I found certain indications of what they were doing, and I'm kind of trying to reconstruct this. And I think they may have suppressed this knowledge. And guess what his name was? I could guess. Gottfried Leibniz. Whoa. The other inventor of the calculus. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So they weren't pulling any punches on this. No, they weren't pulling any punches. They're saying, you know, if you stop and consider what these three mathematicians who've been torturing us ever since are saying. <laughs> They're saying, okay, there's a, there's a hidden form of mathematical analysis. It was lost or suppressed. They're most All three of them agree that it's probably suppressed. And Leibniz is going on to say, oh, and by the way, I think I've kind of figured out some. Unbelievable. <laughs> so, in other words, what these guys are telling you, there's a hidden tradition. Mm-hmm. And all three, interestingly enough, are involved in setting up these scientific colleges and societies. Right. All three of them. So, in other words, I do think on that basis alone that you're looking at least at the continuity of idea. And when you add into this mix the Masons, the Rosicrucians, the Templars, the odd appearance of the Templars investigating and trying to find hidden knowledge in Palestine and Constantinople and what have you, that yes, there, these are indicators that there is an organizational continuity of some sort going on. Yeah, 